to call this Thompson Board of Selectmen meeting to order on January 20th, 2022 from the Donald A. Russell meeting room. Would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Patty, would you Oh, please. David Douglas. I am here. Marie Brilliant. Here. Ruth Lyons. Here. Pat Nixon. Present. Roland Tufts. He's been excused. Roland's been excused. And our town manager, Garrett Skipchansky, is also at the table. Thank you, Patty. Welcome. Town manager's report. Well, welcome, everyone. I'd like to first say Happy New Year and welcome to Topical's first 2022 board select board meeting. A uh, select board meeting. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, first item, Topsman's Charter Commission has scheduled the second public hearing date for January 26th at 6.30 p.m. at Don Russell Meeting Room here at Town Hall. The Charter Commission will be taking comments in person and online. A Zoom link will also be posted on the town's website for those who wish to participate remotely. Uh, we have good news from the police department. Um, I'm pleased to report that on December 17th, police officers Ryan Camarda and Robert Wright graduated from the Maine Criminal Justice Academy after 18 weeks of training, uh, congratulations to them both. And uh, tonight I'd like to welcome and thank Lois Skillings, Dr. Chris Bowie of Med Midcoast Hospital and Yvette Meunier of Topsom's Energy Committee for attending tonight's meeting to provide us with updates. Thank you. Were there any questions of the manager? We will jump right into our update, COVID status at Midcoast Hospital with Lois Skillings, president of Midcoast Hospital and Dr. Chris Bowe, Midcoast Hospital. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you for allowing us to join you remotely this evening. Um, I'm Lois Skillings, the president of Midcoast Hospital. I'm pleased to have with me here tonight, Dr. Chris Bovey, who's our chief medical officer. If you'd like, I'll try to share my screen so that I can show you a PowerPoint slide. But also, um, if this doesn't work, uh, we have uh, something on standby ready to go. Can you see this okay? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, let me just see here. <clears throat> you can still see it okay? Yes. Okay, we reached out several weeks ago to all of our area town councils and select boards to ask if we could come and give you an update. Uh, we've done this several times throughout this pandemic and just think it's important for each community to hear from your local health system what's happening. It's one thing to hear on the six o'clock news what's happening around the state and hear what's happening across the country and the world. But it's, I think, so important for you to know what's happening close to home. And uh, we thought we would bring you an update today. Um, truly, we are at the biggest surge we've seen since this pandemic started in March of 2022. In fact, we have remained at full capacity for inpatient beds for well over a month, actually since just after Thanksgiving. And we had seen over the past few weeks a slight decline over this peak that really we're seeing in mid-December of 25 inpatients a day, but it's uh, now back on the rise. It went down a little bit, but now it's back on the rise. And as of today, we have 22 inpatients for COVID-19 uh, here at Midcoast Hospital. And we're seeing an increase of community spread positive numbers, unlike anything we've ever seen since this started. So um, Dr. Bobby will talk more about this. We're really grateful that the current Omicron variant seems to be less virulent overall, causing less people in our ICU on respirators than certainly we saw in December and November with the Delta surge. At the same time though, the sheer numbers are overwhelming. And even though we're seeing people who are vaccinated and boosted with mild disease of Omicron variant of COVID-19, every single day we're seeing people admitted to the hospital um, with this, even with this variant. So it's so important to us to let you know that it is absolutely the biggest part of the surge that we've seen since this pandemic started. Because of this surge, and I'll show you this graph here, this is a graph that Maine Health produced. It's actually a couple of weeks old now, um, but it shows you the beginning of the pandemic across the state of Maine and New Hampshire, 
And then the surge that we saw last winter went down again. And then the surge that started in the fall and then peaked in December and started to come back down, but now it's back up again. Um, other impacts here at Midco. So how have we been responding to this? So what's been happening because of this surge of patients, people are boarding in our emergency department um, and every single med surge inpatient that we have, we have 54 beds and they're all full and every ICU bed is full. And this has really been happening again since late November. We paused because of this all non-emergency surgeries for patients who might require an overnight stay since late November. That's mostly impacting people who are waiting for total knee replacements or total hip replacements that might have to spend the night. We've had to postpone those surgeries since then. And two weeks ago, we started dialing back even more non-urgent services. Um, for example, in our ambulatory surgery center, we've closed two operating rooms so that we can send our providers and staff to be reassigned to the med surge unit ICU in the emergency department. We've also transferred some of our primary care staff. One of our primary care doctors is now serving full-time as an inpatient hospitalist. And one of our nurse practitioners actually from Topsom um, is serving as a full-time ICU nurse. We do have in this ambulatory surgery center 14 beds that the state has given us permission to turn into inpatient beds if it's needed. Uh, right now, um, we frankly would not have the staff to open that 14 bed unit, but it's there. In order to do that, we would dial back even more operating rooms and transfer even more staff to open those beds. So um, we have that in our back pocket if it gets worse in the next few weeks. Um, so this is a real thing that's happening. You see about this on the news, but yesterday, for example, in our, we have a 21 bed emergency department. And at one point yesterday, we actually had to go on diversion. We had over 50 patients. We had 52 patients in our 21 bed emergency department. And, um, it's, it's unlike anything I've ever seen in my 42 year career in healthcare and as a nurse myself um, to see the number of patients that we're caring for at any one given time here in the hospital. So there are ways that the public can help. And this is why we reached out um, a month or so ago to ask everybody, when you're inside a public place, please wear a mask regardless of your vaccine status right now, because this variant is so contagious. Please get vaccinated. And as soon as you're able get your booster shot, and note that the vast majority of those that are hospitalized for COVID-19, those that are on respirators and those who are dying of COVID-19 are unvaccinated. We see this every day, um, that it's the people, majority of people who come into the hospital and need to be admitted who are very sick are unvaccinated. Also, please be kind and patient with your care team members who are working extraordinarily hard every single day in the face of significant capacity and staffing challenges. And we're also encouraging the public to get your flu shot. Um, the flu is here in Maine. It's a particularly nasty version of the flu this year, and it is not too late. We really encourage folks to get your flu shot so that if you do get the flu, it's not as bad of a, um, of, of a sickness that you would without your flu shot. So with this, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Bovey, and um, he's going to share with you some more details and some more um, and answer some of your questions, and we'll both answer your questions as well. I'm, I'm Dr. Chris Bovey, the, the Chief Medical Officer at Midcoast, as, as Lois mentioned, and I really appreciate a chance to be here tonight and have some discussion back and forth. I'd love to tell you, uh, as Lois shared, about the situation we're in right now and be happy to answer any questions. But um, we do want to talk about masking and, and what we're doing. Masking uh, has been proven to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, we've had amazing fortune at Midcoast Hospital by following our careful rules about everyone being masked in the facility. We've actually had zero cases that we can identify where people were wearing the equipment we need them to wear where they got COVID from a patient. So that's been really, really valuable, really important and almost a two year track record of when people are wearing the, the protective equipment, we ask them to wear the masks and, and the other gowns for taking care of patients with COVID. We haven't had a person who's uh, gotten COVID from a patient. And we're, we're very careful to not have patients get it from each other. Those are things we're very proud of. And a big part of that is, is the masking that's been in place. In addition to masking, there, there's all the other important things, the basics we like to say, and you've heard this time and time again, but getting vaccinated and getting a booster if you're eligible, maintaining physical distance of those who, who don't live in your home and you're not with all the time, 
you know, doing everything to be careful with your hand hygiene when you touch a doorknob before you before you eat and avoiding those large gatherings and making sure when you're in a bigger space that it's adequately ventilated. The, these basics have really worked and it's been so important because now we're faced with a much more virulent strain of COVID with this Omicron variant. And, and the more we rely on the basics, the, the more it pays off and it, it's really critical for us. Um, we know that wearing masks in indoor spaces really makes a difference. When we have this slide, um, just about the effectiveness of masks and actually, um, and I won't spend too much time on it because there's a lot of detail, but on the, on the top or on the x-axis across uh, horizontally, you see if a person who's in, near someone who's infected with COVID, if they're wearing a mask or not wearing a mask or a cloth mask or an N95, which is the, the medical mask we're wearing. And then on the y-axis or the vertical axis, you see what a person infected with COVID might be wearing. And you see how long it takes to have an infective dose pass from one person to another. So you see in the top left corner, if, if a person infected with COVID is not wearing any mask and the person who's sitting next to them is not wearing any mask, in 15 minutes, you'll get 100% of an infective dose. So 100% uh, of that will be delivered to another person. Um, obviously, vaccination changes your risk of getting infected and boosters help as well. But not wearing any mask in a short period of time, you're going to get a, a high risk of exposure when you're within six feet of another person. And if you just take that first example and say that the person who's wearing no mask who has COVID and they encounter another person who's wearing an N95 or a KN95 mask that's not fit tested, uh, the, the KN95, the second to last mask, would in an hour and a quarter, so an hour and 15 minutes, they would only receive a 20% infected dose. So that, that really speaks to how the masks um, provide protection to both the person who has um, COVID when they're possibly spreading it and someone who's uh, nearby them. If we could go to the next slide. Vaccinations have been so important and our community has been very well vaccinated compared to others. And that served us well early in this pandemic. When there have been surges throughout the state, it's always been a little bit less in our region. And that's because I believe of the vaccination statistics. We've been very well vaccinated. We've given over 73,000 doses. I think we're above 75,000 now, just after the last week or so. Um, we, we offer those vaccinations now at 81 Medical Center Drive at the building just before the hospital. And it's easy to sign up for vaccinations at vaccine.mainhealth.org where individuals can call and you see the number on the screen. And we also uh, did understand that some people were having a hard time navigating that webpage or, or getting through and, and felt that it was challenging to get a vaccination. And so we, we established a, just a walk-in time, we call it our walk-in Wednesdays. And from nine until noon every, every Wednesday, we have people just to uh, handle anyone who just wants to walk in. So someone who's having a hard time signing up and wants to just walk in for an appointment can just happily do that. And we're able to give boosters, first shots. If you get your first shot, we'll schedule you for your second shot at that time right away. So um, we want to continue uh, keeping really strong vaccination numbers. We think that makes a, a significant difference. And for individuals who are on the fence or th there's all kinds of um, information on social media about the value of vaccinations. And if you're not sure about a vaccination and you wanna talk to somebody, we really encourage you to talk to your healthcare professional someone who has you know, made a, a, an arrangement, you know, a partnership with you to look out for your health, we, we would love for you to spend time talking with them if you have questions about vaccination. It can be so challenging to get information of all different varieties on the internet or other spaces that you know, when you trust somebody with your health and you ask them to help you with your health, please, please seek out their advice if you're, if you're on the fence about vaccinations because we think that can provide you some really valuable advice. So with that, again, really grateful to have the chance to speak with the group tonight and happy to take any questions. Anyone on the board have any questions? Lois, I've got, and, and I hope, because I think you, you oversee Midcoast Hospital itself, not the Midcoast practices, right? Um, oh, both, okay. So as we're almost two years in now, and we've seen tremendous effects on individuals, you know, it, it seems as though every day somebody looks at a number, if it goes down, people feel better, right? And if it's going up, they, they're, they're more intense, and we're seeing high levels of anxiety and such. 
And I know that's translated, you guys service um, mental health, both at the hospital and offsite and such. How has your response been to that, being able to handle those cases, um, enough staffing? Are we seeing something similar on that side as, as we are to the physical portion also? And this is, this is a, a far longer reaching and a slow, and it probably gives you more time to react, that would be my guess um, to this. But how are, you, how are you reacting and how are things at, on that level? Well, I'm so glad you asked that because we think of mental health as health. So mental health is the brain from here up, you know, health is the whole. So we truly see mental health as an essential part of healthcare because everything that happens to our mental health affects our overall health. And so we have seen um, actually a real increase in the number of people that we're seeing seeking mental health care. We're seeing a rise in people with substance use disorder. Um, just this morning, we have a local mental health task force where you know, law enforcement and area mental health professionals come together to hear about the significant increase in um, either arrests or instances of driving under the influence that our communities are seeing. This is happening here, it's happening across the state and the country. After Hurricane Katrina, public health experts um, found that for the next three to five years after that, national dis natural disaster, that there was a hundredfold increase in depression and substance use disorder and a 50% increase in heart disease. So public health if events create increased mental health crisis. Here at Midcoast, um, our emergency department sees on any given day, we have patients who are also in our emergency department awaiting placement. Um, five, sometimes up to 10 or 12 patients who need inpatient care, but we can't get them an inpatient bed anywhere because either Riverview has closed down beds because of staffing or COVID or um, Spring Harbor Hospital in Portland is not able to do that. Or our own unit is full. We only have a very small unit here. So we're definitely seeing that play out um, across our community as well as across the state as well. Now, yeah, that that's such a such a great question. We really appreciate you asking. And, and what we've been trying to do for it is to try to figure out how we can meet patients where they're at. Um, we've been trying to do telehealth so that we can see people safely. We, we have great success. A, a lot of patients do very well with group therapy when, when they're together with others who have similar issues and that, that helps them a lot. And, and that's been a challenge, but we've been doing that on telehealth because we know that that's of significant value to people and we have to get them in those settings. But you're spot on. That that's a significant um, sort of a side effect, but but really an after effect of this long-lasting pandemic. It's interesting that three to five years. I think you said three to five years. Um, <laughs> I had to reset everything. Um, that's an interesting factor. So that's something. This is an ongoing ramp up for you guys, would be my guess, is in thinking. All right, well, I mean, you guys are under pressure for other reasons, and I don't need to keep asking questions on that. I mean, yeah, but the focus, okay, well, I'm just, I'm thinking the focus, is that something you are able to, as an administrative staff, is that something you are able to tackle right now, or are you solely focused on, and I know the health portion, I know the end up in the town, but. Oh. We are definitely focused on the mental health challenges. Um, we are, you know, continuing to try to find uh, creative solutions. So, for example, we've increased access to psychiatrists in our emergency department who are able to do telehealth consultations to help us to actually treat the patient and begin that treatment while they're right in the emergency department. Um, our addiction resource center continues to see patients for medication assisted treatment and that happens st can start right in the emergency department as well. And our um, partial hospitalization program, we work closely with Maine Behavioral Health to see patients on an outpatient. So we've, we've never stopped working just as hard as we can on, on the mental health aspect of, of, of care as well. And, and COVID complicating that, so today we had an hour-long meeting from the main health system to, to try to figure out where we can best take care of people with a mental health issue that need inpatient care, but also have COVID. 
And, and it's different in how we care for these individuals because they're in units where they can walk around, they can walk out of their room, they can go to a, to a kind of a living room type space, they can eat together. And that's different than other hospitalized patients who typically are in their one room the whole time. So when people are more communal, then that's much easier to spread COVID. So we have been planning so hard and being so careful to not get patients with COVID into Spring Harbor Hospital, for example, because the worry is once it gets there, then it's gonna spread from patient to patient to patient. So today we were, we were having an hour long meeting saying, are, are we gonna put some patients in a select area of Spring Harbor Hospital who have COVID infection? Or are we gonna use some space that Southern Maine Medical Center has or some space that Midcoast has to try to take patients who have COVID and need mental health care as an inpatient in a safe spot and keeping other people safe and not spreading it. So this is an ongoing key part of our, of our care delivery right now. Thank you. Any further questions with the board? No, okay, sorry. Um, I think that's it, folks. We appreciate it. We'll see you again shortly and hopefully under far different conditions, I would imagine. Absolutely, and again, thank you so much. The community has been so supportive throughout this pandemic. We're so grateful for that and grateful for the opportunity to come to give you a real life pulse check on what's happening here. I, I will share with you that it is very, very challenging right now and people are working just as hard as they can to deliver that safe and effective care to people under extraordinary circumstances. So thank you for your patience. Thank you to our local Topsom law enforcement and EMS and firefighters. Our first responders are right there as partners with us on the front line. And uh, we're grateful for all the work that they're doing to help us keep the community safe as well. So. Do you know they were in the corner? Is that why you did that? Lewis? No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I, I, yeah, I, we I can't see them. Little, <laughs> Thank you, folks. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Well, good evening. All good, Mark. Uh, next up is an update from the Energy Committee. Yvette Meunier, she's the chair. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks for putting me on the agenda. Um, first, I have an update, and I noticed that I didn't add um, something to it, but since October, we haven't been here to do the update, but we did have our first um, educational webinar in November, and it was about weatherization, and it went well, and um, can you hear me? <laughs> oh, we hear you. We just couldn't see you. <laughs> um, it went well, um, and we are planning our second one. It is going to be on beneficial electrification. It's going to be um, Wednesday, uh, February 2nd, from 6 to 7, again on Zoom. Um, I hope folks will join because three of our committee members are going to be giving our personal stories about um, our journeys to electrify our lives. And we will also have Visions in Maine there um, to talk more about uh, rebates and things like that. Um, Yvette, is that a pre-sign up or they can just show up? Uh, it's it's on Zoom, and right now, um, until Rod gets back on okay. Monday, um, I found out that the link isn't there to register, but okay. we'll keep pumping out the promotions. No one will miss, miss okay. it. <laughs> so there is a registration, but they can probably jump on also. Yeah, there's yeah. a yeah. Okay, perfect. Please can do that. Yeah. Talk a little I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the next thing um, that the committee continues to look forward to is eventually having the workshop on the RFQ regarding LED lights. Um, I know that that's in the works and so hopefully um, we'll be doing that in February or something. So it's still on our plate. Um, and then earlier today, um, two energy committee members, am I still good? So um, today, the Energy Committee uh, asked University of Maine students if they were interested in a couple of projects that we presented to them. So it's their um, sustainability, energy, economics, and policy class. So we are going to be free. Students can help us with some of our projects because we're going to have a lot of stuff coming up. Um, and two of the project, the two projects were one is to help us with um, one of our next webinar series. 
Um, we plan on doing one about the three different ways people can invest in solar. So, um, you know, being part of a solar farm, ownership of a solar farm, um, being part of subscription solar that everybody's getting the mailers about, and then um, also investing it on your own property. So uh, the students will be, if they choose our projects, one or both or none, we'll know in early February, um, they would help create one of the presentations for that project, help us with our website. We already have lots of info, but it gets outdated. So do that. And then um, some other like cost benefit analysis. And then the second project is uh, with the data that we received about the um, vehicles that the town's fleet vehicles um, to see if they can provide some further analysis on alternatives um, and then any infrastructure that could be needed. So we thought it would be a nice opportunity to get a third party in, a bunch of students who could, um, you know, the service learning project. I think it's a really great resume builder. And when I was giving my presentation to them, I tried to sell them. So hopefully between me and Jared, um, we'll hear from them. Um, oh, and then last, we'll get to it next, um, is that I wanted to, uh, the Energy Committee wants to present to you an opportunity for some grant funding um, in regards to energy efficiencies. There are some other projects for resiliency and climate change and, and so forth, but um, we have some good ideas and uh, we want to let you know about the process and hopefully um, find out if we can move forward or just keep working on it. No, that you've got that's the governor's office of policy. That's what we're doing that time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I thought I thought for a second there it was we haven't scheduled it yet. I'm like, no, I, I plan on talking about it. You gotta approve your meeting minutes. Okay. I think in between oh, yeah. me and that. So. You gotta go take a break. <laughs> um, I think I read in your memo that the LED proposals are in. How long do you think before we can actually start setting? Just because February starts budget, I want to make sure. We all have dates ready. Um, Rod's working with him. He's on vacation this week. Okay. And so uh, as soon as he gets back on Monday, we'll set up a date with the board. Okay. Uh, with concurrence from the committee. Great. Okay. Perfect. Any questions about this portion of the update before we get to the agenda? No. Thank you, Yvette. We'll see you in a bit. All right, we are on to public comment. Uh, correspondence. I received one email um, over the last week requesting that Topsum evaluate a mask mandate. And what's that what? one? Yep. Yeah. I had other notes, Matt. I'm sorry. I knew I was going to mess one of these up. We're going to go backwards to public comment, folks. And I'm going to have you start. All right. Just because there's not a very good spot for this in the agenda, um, based on, I think, uh, some of the information we've received, it might be worthwhile if the board considered asking the sewer district to look into doing some wastewater treatment um, testing, similar to what Yarmouth is doing right now. And obviously, that's not something that we can to ourselves, um, but I think we can at least ask administration down to question um, the sewer district if they can do something like that, first of all. And secondly, based on, uh, on Dr. Shaw's announcements yesterday, I mean, they are expanding the program to a number of different towns. And I guess the other question that would stick in my mind is whether or not there's even room for it. So I think that would probably determine whether or not we can go down this road. Right, just so Matt, he and I talked a little bit today, and I just think a head shake to say, can we ask the questions easy enough for our group? Um, Dr. Shaw talked about 20 communities around the state that they've identified to uh, study wastewater to check COVID um, levels. And we have no idea if we're one of those, they've identified 20 and such. Basically, we're looking to see, are we, and if not, could we be, could we, you know, we're willing to be partners in this. So just ask the town manager to speak with the Thompson Sewer District and probably even follow up with Brenda because we may be combined because mm -hmm. we do get combined. Um, just can you ask those questions? I can ask. Thank you. Second, um, 
We are going to have asked for it to be put on the next agenda because it requires a public posting. Um, we are required if we want to hold any remote meetings that we need to take a vote as a board and to accept that. And that would not as much a remote meeting, but is allow remote individuals to, to be a part of this and such. So just so everyone knows that has been requested to be on the next, the February 3rd agenda, it'll be posted publicly like it should be. And then we'll take that up there. I think all other committees have done it in town now at this point. So those are the public comments, just because they didn't have a good place to fall. Now I'm gonna to jump to correspondence. Uh, I did receive one email in the last uh, week to 10 days in the individual asking that Thompson consider a mask mandate. Also, I have received probably in the last four days, I don't know, from Thompson, actual Thompson residents, I received five uh, emails that we don't take a mask mandate on. As that's not on our agenda at this time, but those are correspondence that I've received. Did anyone else receive any correspondence? Ruth? Likewise, I have received the same thing. My requests are that we don't consider a mask mandate. Uh, individual steps asking. Right. Okay. And I, I will just tell everybody um, the way the town of Topsom has been since March 16th, 2020, is that. We look to take our directives. We, we respond to the CDC directives in the governor's um, executive, order. executive orders. And we, re, we rely on the experts to do that. And, and it's treated us well. It's, it's allowed everyone in town to be on the same page, to, to know that we're doing the same thing that the state is doing. Um, so it's, it's worked well for us. And, and from where I sit, that's the way we'll consider it. And we don't have anything in the works. So <laughs> all the emails keep coming and there's nothing there. So, um, and that was all the correspondence there. Adjustments to the agenda. We do need to take a vote. Um, we can do it right here. 2205, consideration any appropriate action on the OSHA required mandatory vaccination or testing policy. The agenda came out before the Supreme Court ruling, I think it was last Friday. Subsequently, uh, the town manager said that Maine OSHA did not hold a meeting following that. So it's essential this whole process is no longer moving forward. We do not need to take this subject matter up. So I'll make a motion that we remove 2205 from consideration of this evening's agenda. Okay. Motion then seconded. All those in favor? Unanimous. Consent calendar. Approval of the minutes, the regular select board meeting, December 16, 2021. We haven't been here for a month. I make a motion that we approve the minutes as written. Second. Motion and seconded. All those in favor? I vote in here. Two. You guys got to abstain then? Okay, don't vote against them because then it fails. <laughs> 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 All right, no public hearing, no unfinished business. No new business. Hey, come on up here, Dad. 2201, first of 2022. <laughs> Consideration and any appropriate action to support the Energy Committee to participate in the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation and the Future. Go, Piff. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about this opportunity. Um, there's $4.75 million um, that's going to be allocated to municipalities around the state. There's three uh, grant opportunities. Um, there are some for service providers that will be assisting towns do this work. Um, and then there will be the grants that the towns can apply for. Um, I am here tonight to, I've been through all of all of their presentations at the governor's office. Um, and I'm here tonight to try and encourage uh, the town to consider taking um, some of the steps to be qualified to um, apply for a grant. So it is called the Community Resiliency Partnership. And so for any towns to actually um, even apply for a grant, they have to do basically three things. Um, and so I wanna talk about those. And I also wanted to talk about um, the reason why I want to come tonight 
while the grants will be given out, the first grant will be in March, the application due in March, late March, second one's in September, and then it'll be a similar process the following year. So we know that there'll be two years worth of grant opportunities. However, most towns are not poised to actually get through um, the first steps to get onto the um, partnership, but we are. Um, and the grants will only get more competitive over time as it becomes more well known, so on and so forth. So if we don't, um, we can't move forward with uh, a motion to, to take up one of the action items that we, we need to do today. You know, of course, there's more time, um, but I'm here to advocate for that. So um, any questions before I go through kind of like a timeline and like kind of what, what we need to do? Okay. So. Uh, it might be helpful just to talk a little bit more about what these grants actually do. Um, we'll get into the timeline. Yeah, totally. Um, so they came out with, uh, you can, they came out with a list of 77 actions that towns can take without any match at all. Um, and then you can kind of go and do your own thing, but then there is some match required, but it's pretty minimal. Um, but the action items range from anything from installing electric vehicle charging stations, leasing or buying electric vehicles, um, a lot of different stuff for like resiliency planning and flooding and mitigation, you know, hazard mitigation. There's ordinances that you could draft up. Um, there are a lot of energy efficiency things. There's community gardens in there. There's LED street lights. There's heat pump installation. I mean, there's all, I mean, there's so many things. Um, so, you know, that we, we find that there's some projects that we've been talking about that kind of fit in, in those that we think would be good to come forward with. Um, but before we can, you know, really determine if that's something to, that you guys want to do, we just have to go through a couple of exercises um, to, you know, get registered with, with a partnership. Um, so one of the first things we have to do is there's a hazard mitigation um, self-assessment. And Rod in the planning office has already taken a look at that. Um, most of the uh, answers come from a Saginaw County FEMA, FEMA, I can't remember what it is, but Rod's totally had a look, look at it and he's filled it out. So one of the things that we have to do is provide that to the partnership and we also have to provide it to the community. The other thing that, the other exercise that I've already done and I showed Rod what I had done is there is 77 lists of activities um, and we you're supposed to go through the list and determine what you've already done and we've done a ton of them. And um, then we need to show the community what we've already done. You know, we've done a climate action plan. We've, you know, done some of these energy efficiency upgrades. There's more to be done. We have the power purchase agreement for solar. Like there's a lot of stuff that we already have to celebrate. And we also have um, the climate action plan to back up some of our, you know, some of the conversation. So we need to provide that to the community and also the partnership. And then um, lastly, we need the uh, select board to pass a resolution, which would allow us to um, undertake the partnership. And I've provided the, um, I think it was like three paragraphs. These are, it's all completely required. Um, there's additional language that's not required, but this as it is would be the language that, that we, we, we would pass. So once we've um, been able to do those three things, then we could apply for a grant. Um, and do you want to know what grant I think we could apply for first? <laughs> uh, so there's talk about upgrading the LED, uh, the street light for the street lights in Lower Village, and then also the ones in the parking lot here, the LEDs. Um, Rod said that there you already have maybe a quote for thirty-nine thousand dollars from one of the projects, maybe in the parking. I can't recall. The, uh, <laughs> we have an estimate for the uh, parking lot out here for thirty-nine thousand. That was the same as two years ago. What we did two years ago as well as we budgeted for the lower main street lights, but we were waiting to implement that project until we got the design spec for the bridge lights to have a match on the way. So this is an opportunity that, that came up and uh, an event and myself met with uh, Mark not too long ago to bring this forward. And it's a great opportunity that fits. 
not only the intent of this, but uh, the, the estimate that we had received for this project. And it kind of goes in hand with the, uh, the initiative with the uh, LED RFQ yeah. that's, that's happening right now. Yeah, so that would be really exciting if we get somewhere with that. You know, September would be the next time that we could bring something forward. Um, and then, of course, there'll be two other opportunities. So, you know, not to pressure or anything, but it just kind of seems like, hey, we're on top of this. I, I don't think it's the language that you would have to pass, and I don't find controversial. Um, and it's really the way to open the door for, for the money. Um, what we're also doing, our, our next energy committee meeting is on Tuesday, 4.30 on Zoom. And we have taken the opportunity to turn that into a workshop to present to the public the two documents that we need to have to bring forward. So we're doing that in hopes that eventually we will get this resolution passed with y'all and be ready to go the instant that happens. Um, so we're, we're moving through things and hoping for support. Good question. Go ahead. If we go through the resolution and have the public hearings, um, does that mean we're free to just apply to um, future offerings without having to go through a process like this again? Yes. Um, there was something in the grant that said, well, I'm, side note, I'm applying for the grant, one of the service provider grants. And in there it says, and help communities. Um, re-up their status with the partnership. But there's nothing in it right now that says anything about what that would be. So we just wrote something like, when we find out, we will do something about it. So as far as I know, there's nothing else we're going to need to do, but until further notice. But I would assume for the next, at least the next year, it is what it is. But. Cool. Thanks. And I have no real heartburn but it always, when we designate anybody and the state's telling us we have to designate somebody, it feels as though this board is those that, when I mean, we were elected officials, that I don't view it as we're giving, but it always, it, that last paragraph certainly does feel that we're designating, essentially we're handing off all decisions to, to the board, but it's, and I don't know if we, if I'm more comfortable if we have that paragraph so you're, it meets the, what you need, but also, you know, a line that says following our levels of engagement, you know, must work with staff, and must work with the, under the board of select, uh, select board. Yeah. yeah. I mean, any grant we want to come forward with, you all have right. to give us approval. So. Well, that's what we want to, I want to make sure that's all right. still in place. Mm -hmm. That is, nothing's changed that five years down the road and there's none of us and none of you same different people and we're not working in the same manner. So am I overreacting? I'm looking for feedback. No, I think that's quite. Do we want to put a- I think that's a legitimate concern. I mean, you could solve it as easily as just doing uh, top of the energy committee and Derek um, or- Or just planning department. Yeah, planning I mean, department. I would be fine if it, I just wrote it us, but yeah, it can yeah. be just planning department since there are staff. I just, I just think it, I feel, we're the elected, we're the ones expected to do. I should say, I think the planning department with you or myself. Okay. So, under rather than the town of Thompson designates the Thompson planning department right. to coordinate planning and implementation, and they're still going to hand it off to you. <laughs> that was the only question I had in the whole thing. I, I think this is great. Um, and I do, you say there's no rush. I think there is a rush. I think I you to yes. get to a march. <laughs> For you to hit that March twenty uh, second date, there is a rush, um, but I don't see any reason why we would. No. So, we need to I hate resolutions. I will tell you that I am so anti resolutions. I don't believe they mean anything, but I'm going to do it just for you guys. Okay. <laughs> um, so I will make a motion with the following resolution. Whereas the town of Thompson will complete the community resilience partnerships, community resilience self-assessment and list of community actions and hold community workshops, which will prioritize projects for implementation within 60 days of passing this resolution. Be it resolved, the town of Thompson commits to participating in the community resilience partnership, which supports community leadership in reducing greenhouse gas emissions 
and increasing resiliency to extreme weather and climate change impacts. Be it further resolved that the town of Thompson designates the Thompson Planning Department to coordinate planning, implementation, and monitoring of energy and resilience projects to be the primary point of contact to the Community Resilience Partnership. Do I have a second? Second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. Patty, that's all in her. I didn't know if you followed along with me. So I did. Okay, so when you're writing it up. Motion and seconded. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you, Yvette. Cool. First item of the year, down. <laughs> 2202 <laughs> is next. Consideration any appropriate action to have Sagadahawk County take responsibility of town radio systems to improve new equipment and future maintenance. Chief. Yes, good evening, Chris McGlawan, Fire Chief. Um, I'm also here on behalf of the Police Department. We met with Sag County Dispatch, Sag County EMA, PD, and Fire back in December to discuss a project that county was moving forward with. Tonight, what I need from the board is the county needs to know whether we want to participate in this project. They have to put it up for RFP, and whether we're on board or not will drastically change their RFP. So I have Mike Carter from the Sag County Dispatch uh, Director. He can answer the technical questions because I'm not a radio guy and I'm not going to pretend to be. And he can kind of go through the quick rundown of what the county's doing on their level regarding this. So, thank you for having me. Uh, like you said, Mike Carter, Sagadoc Dispatch Director. Um, way back, a little backstory on this uh, December of 2019, um, you know, we. I was a newly promoted deputy director. We had a newly promoted director and we kept getting complaints about the radio system. You know, these were happening years and years before we even stepped in. So we said, why don't we have a third party come in and look at it independently? We used uh, Norm Boucher from Communications Design Consulting out of New Hampshire. He has done hundreds of jobs in New England, including current ones being done by Penobscot, Aldo, and Oxford. Um, and then after, of course, December 2019, we all know what happened a couple months later, everything slowed down. And then finally, we're just starting to pick this back up, but he's identified, um, we have eight current sites, excluding Topsom right now within the county. He wants to decommission two and add six more, which would include a site on the public safety building, and it would ultimately, um, uh, put Topsom Fire and Topsom Police on a shared county frequency. Um, I was around way back when, when I was a Topsom dispatcher, when we were in the old building behind the old town hall, and I was a part of the transition over. Um, I didn't go right to the county. I've been there since around 2007, 16 years now. I, I don't, I wasn't involved in what happened in the past. Um, I know people have their opinions, but all I can say is um, you know, we, have, we have commissioners committed to fixing this communication issue. We have a once in a lifetime possibility with the ARPA funding to make this possible. And the uh, radio infrastructure that has been proposed is, is, is top of the line, uh, uh, very redundant and, you know, talks with the Topsom fire chiefs. Uh, well, that's what's the catch. You might have to share it frequently. And it would be, it, it would obviously be worked out and everyone within Topsom fire and all the other fire departments and police departments would have input on this because it's not just gonna be me making these decisions. But um, as far as any technical aspects, do you have any type of questions on it should have happened a long time ago. It should have happened the first time we cut bait and went to second half. It should have happened then. You no, know, I'm not asking you. I'm just I'm no, making I a statement. Um, and so I, I'm very happy this is this is here. There is someone in the room that was around way back when, uh, <laughs> and he's we're in the same page. You've heard of this mystical, mythical paperwork that says what was supposed to happen, but we can't find it. Right. But I can assure you, if, if if this goes forward, we will be able to find all. Necessary paperwork to, to. My only, uh, and it's not, I don't know if it's technical or not. The only question I have is so we buy a new vehicle from here on out. County, is that coming out of county budget? A new radio to it? Does it come out of our purchase? 
How does that work? Because if what, you guys take over, we take over like tower sites and main radio. As far as portable radios and mobile radios inside police cars and fire trucks, that's still town. That's <laughs> municipality. <laughs> um, but what I, what I can say is, uh, obviously, this if it was signed today, it won't happen tomorrow. But any equipment we currently have, we'll, we'll use until it's you know all the equipment in the fire trucks will use can still be used till their end of life yep. and then upgrade. Got a couple questions. Go ahead, Matt. Um, so in terms of future maintenance, mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, it definitely is. Mm -hmm. uh, what types of expenses can we expect to see in the county budget going forward? That might be a result, or it might be an increase as a result of this upgrade, if any. Uh, really, the only thing moving forward after total completion, which if signed today would be roughly two to three years to completion, um, is yearly maintenance, yearly preventative maintenance, just like changing oil in your car, rotating tires. Um, um, with a big system, there are different levels with our current radio company. Obviously, we might know the vendor going forward. There's not many to me, but um, the only expense would be, like I said, the per year, yearly preventative maintenance. Which happens now, anyway. To a certain extent? Uh, it's happened once in the last couple months. It hadn't happened before. Okay. I'm embarrassed to say, but that wasn't my call. So, follow up on that. Ruth and I are on the finance committee for the county. Mm -hmm. um, and we were talking about this project last year before ARPA funds were even mm -hmm. a glimmer in someone's eye. So I'm curious if there were funds available then, um, where that available funding might be going now if we're using ARPA funding. The, we, the, the funding that was set aside in the capital plan for the radio upgrade mm -hmm. um, and this project are very two different things. Um, the money set aside in the capital plan was to upgrade current equipment that was coming to end of life next year and the year after within the tower sites we currently own and operate. Okay, I gotcha. We're looking at now shifting, you know, with all brand new equipment. So that money will be reallocated or it could be put into the project to save our equipment. That has not been decided. That's 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 ultimately that could, that's a discussion for a later date okay. of like where those funds are. Thank you. How's this committee going to operate with equal voices? There's a lot of voices at the table, right? Yep. Um, ultimate decisions probably come down to the county. Um, the, 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 as far as technical aspects, we do have a lot of tech savvy, both police and fire with the radio. Um, ultimately, we'll sit down with those and the radio consultant and a potential vendor. And they'll come up with a plan okay. to say, this is what we can give you. This is what we think is going to work the best. Mm -hmm. And I, I did have meetings with, uh, I invited all the fire chiefs. You guys are nice enough to let me use the building upstairs and the police department and the fire department. And then the next day we had it with the police department. So everyone's already seen this as the first step of all right and i think ultimately it's for a lack of a better term well you can't make it any worse so go ahead <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> well, we heard from uh well, I mean, we got the letter and everything but i think that comment about sharing frequencies um just reaffirming from folks actually use the radio might be a good idea that's okay with them and what types of issues that might pose Good evening, Mark Hagan, Chief of Police. No, we think this is a great opportunity that we don't want to miss. Um, yeah, the one drawback, if there was, was would be the potential of sharing a frequency. You know, right now, should I say the way we're talking about it, as far as who we'd be sharing with, or should is that yeah, and then it, it, so, so right now we're looking at Tops and PD would be sharing with Richmond PD. Um, between the two of us, I don't think there's such a Excessive number of calls that we can't make that work, so uh, we're not we're not concerned with that at all. So we just think it's a great opportunity for us. But we had a lot of issues on the west side of town towards Lisbon, 
where we can't get out a lot on our radios. And if you've seen the maps with the overlays of what the new uh, towers will do, it looks like a great opportunity. It's, I can't keep saying that enough. So. We're not gonna have any 5G issues, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no planes coming down in the west side of town. So we should be good. Um, from a fire and rescue standpoint, the, the talk is to keep us and Bath on separate frequencies to have two in the county because we're the two busiest services. So for us, I mean, people are going to have to listen to us right. rather than us having to listen to them. That's the kind of way I look at it. Uh -huh. It'll be a little bit of training. We'll have to, you know, do some stuff in-house, but you got a couple of years to know this is coming. So I don't see it being a problem. We go to most of their fire calls anyway. So we just, we're all on the same page, actually. So, cool. Thank you. Any other questions between the three individuals? No? I think it's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Certainly take advantage. Um, I'll make the motion that we have Second Hawk County take responsibility of town radio systems to include new equipment and future maintenance and to have our chiefs of police and fire being part of the process set this up. Motion and seconded. All those in favor? Sorry, I thought you can't read your face. It's 2203, consideration any appropriate action to allow the town manager to sign a memorandum of understanding to install a public interpretive sign at the Bowdoin Mill Island. Mr. Okay. Manager? Yeah, so uh, this was drafted uh, from Mark Ellison. Just, uh, these interpretive signs, the one that we're, is in question right now, is right over here in the corner. Um, this will be placed right on the island within the mill for people's enjoyment and a little bit of history of uh, the mill. Uh, so this is just an MOU between uh, the town and the owner, which is the Casada, yeah. representing Bowdoin Mill Associates. Just for people at home, we'll get it shown. They are heavier than you think. You're speaking to the camera, look at it. You want to see I did too. Yeah. So, any questions of the manager regarding this proposal? Um, I think it's great. Yeah. Wonderful. So, someone make a motion. I move that um, we allow the town manager to sign a memorandum of understanding with Rick Asada in order to put this by the mill. Does that work, Mark? Second. Right, right. It would be the Bowdoin Mill Island Owners Association. Thank you. Take your friendly amendment to my motion. Yes. Motion and seconded. All those in favor? I it was rude. Thank you. I heard it over there. Yeah. All those in favor, unanimous. Yes. 2204, consideration any appropriate action to award the bid for a new forklift for public works. Dennis. Dennis Cox, top and public works director. Um, in our budget for the current year, is funding for replacement of our 1980 used forklift that we got from Maine Yankee. Oh, um, it, way back. <laughs> uh, probably could be a collector's item. <laughs> we received three bids. Um, cover letter I sent with you folks. You see those. I'm recommending the low bid at thirty-six thousand and thirty dollars. It'll be a pneumatic tire diesel powered unit. Um, we don't need to use propane because we're not inside it. It's an, an enclosed building. Um, with the pneumatic tires, we can use it outside in the uh, dooryard for unloading pelletized materials. We get in like the cast iron grates and covers for storm drains, um, pipe loads. The mechanic will be using it for uh, mechanic work inside the garage, but yes, as well. Any questions? What did you say, Denny? This is always, always out still if we ordered it now, right? It's still be. It's out there about six months. Yeah, quite a ways. Okay. Um, so, no questions. I will make a motion that we accept the bid for the Doosan D25 7, in the amount of $36,030. That's it. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. 2206, consideration any appropriate action on the appointment to the finance committee. 
because 50 years was not enough. <laughs> Mike Libby has submitted an application to be a member of the Finance Committee. We interviewed Mike tonight. Um, that's all I'm going to say. That's 50 years ago. Any, any other comments or anything you want to make? I just welcome him aboard. He knows the town inside now. I will make a motion, motion to appoint Mike Labby to the Finance Committee. Second it. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. The most anticipated point of the evening. Let's do it, Jared. Second that. All those in favor? Unanimous. Yeah.